Words and papers, words and books, words on TV, words for cooks, words for comfort. Welcome to the world of Wordaholics. Yes, welcome to Wordaholics, where we know that Shakespeare was the man who introduced us to such words as assassinate, barefaced, bump, leapfrog, misplaced, and monumental. I'm Giles Brandreth, the man who introduces Wordaholics and invites you to welcome Jack Whitehall, Natalie Haynes, Susie Dent, and Milton Jones. As the old song has it, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. Oh! Well, I know I make audiences happy because whenever I appear on stage, they clap very, very slowly. Sometimes they even throw things at me in their excitement. But I'd like to ask my guests which words make them happy. Jack Whitehall. Um, I like the word homophobic. Um, now, wait, bear with me. Because I'm not... I wouldn't describe myself as being homophobic, but then I would say that I'm homophobic like I'm arachnophobic. I'm not scared of spiders. I'm not scared of gays. Though I would probably scream if I saw one in my bath. <laughs> Susie Dent, the lady who is to count down what Hillary Clinton is to the White House. That is to say, the sinister power that sits behind the throne. <laughs> Susie, which word makes you happy? Blurb. Yes, I just love the bubbly sound of it, but it's also one of the rare examples of a word that you can trace back to its originator. And that originated with someone called Gillette Burgess, who wrote this book called Are You a Bromide? And he produced the special rapper for his book and it featured a beautiful young woman who was called Blinda Blurb and on the copy it said that it has that certain something which makes you want to crawl through 30 miles of dense tropical jungle and bite somebody in the neck <laughs> and I'd love to have that on one of my book jackets. Natalie Haynes um, Apocolicentosis that is a Latin word made up by Seneca when Roman gods died they turned into gods they went through apotheosis and as a sort of joke he suggested that uh, claudius would go through apocolicentosis that he wouldn't turn into a god he'd turn into a pumpkin um <laughs> so apocolicentosis is the act of turning into a pumpkin <laughs> use it in a sentence see how that goes <laughs> finally milton jones what word makes you happy anything with the letter t in it because what people forget is years ago in wales the letter t went on strike and the Great Tea Strike of 1922, or as they had to call it, the Great E Reich of 1922. <laughs> Personally, there is no word that makes me happier than the word silence, as in silence, please, Giles is speaking. <laughs> now it's time for our first round, the letter of the week. And can I ask you to contain your excitement as we welcome this week's letter? It's the letter P. Wow, here he comes, entering the Wordaholics ring and prancing like a peacock, the letter P. Weighing in at 160 pounds, uppercase, and 152 pounds, lowercase, this is a letter that plans to propel itself to the premier position on that podium. He's a prize-winning pugilist with a powerful punch. Ladies and gentlemen, please wave your foam fingers in the air for the letter P. <laughs> And what a pleasure it is to take the P, Jack. The first question is for you. Where does the ploughman's lunch come from? Um, pret a manger. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they invented the sandwich uh, sometime in the mid-90s. And before that, people just ate sort of soups and gruel and stuff. So it is definitely pret a manger. I, I know the answer, so we just move on now to the next question. <laughs> Yeah, good. So that's two points from me and £10,000 from Pret-a-Manger. <laughs> oh, yeah, it works out, doesn't it? Oh, it also came from Nando's. Uh, <laughs> just... For ingenuity, you get a couple of points, but the answer isn't correct. Anybody got any idea where Ploughman's Lunch comes from? Was it a marketing ploy by the Cheese Marketing Board? This is Susie Dent, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Who knows all the answers? <laughs> People would think it was something wonderfully archaic, but it is, in fact, the Ploughman's Lunch. It was invented in the 1960s by the English Country Cheese Council. Natalie Haynes, a P question for you. What is 
a partridge in a pear tree really about? Nursery rhymes are always about either illness or Jesus. Is it is the partridge plague or is it Jesus? Jesus. <laughs> It's a corruption of a Latin phrase, parturit in aperto. I'm giving it an Italian accent because <laughs> my Latin is as modern as tomorrow, but has a lot of time for yesterday. Parturit in, in aperto. So that's she gives birth in the open air. Is yes. that right? Come on! Yeah. Come on, Radio 4! Come on! Give me now the connection between Jesus, Christmas, and the partridge in a pear tree. So it's like Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus. Correct. Has then become a partridge in a pear tree. It has, and you get five full points. At least! Yay! <laughs> and Milton, now a question for you. What was once described as a poor man's jersey? Uh, anything from Primark? <laughs> <laughs> Is it when you're so poor you have to knit your back hair into a cardigan? <laughs> Come on, we've all done it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, unless it's an island, is it like the Isle of Wight or um, uh, Isle of Dogs? Uh, Isles of Tesco. This is very ingenious because you think Jersey is the place, as in poor yeah. man's Jersey, and therefore yeah. you're going to Ireland. You are correct. So I'm going to give you almost there. You're certainly getting three points for having got this far. We are looking for an island. Is the reason it's called a poor man's jersey because on this island, unlike in Jersey, they pay a proper tax. Actually, that's why everyone lives in Jersey, isn't it? Yeah, that may yeah. well be why I went everyone over there, lives in Jersey. Like Bergerac. But actually, yeah. <laughs> tax avoidance or tax. Oh, Isle of Man. Yeah. Susie Dent said the Isle of Man. She scores the points. Well done, Susie <laughs> Dent. <laughs> it's actually the Isle of Man. Jersey is, of course, a haven for those who don't like paying their taxes. And I'm glad you m avoided any references to my jerseys, because people might have said that what I used to wear were poor man's jerseys, and they weren't. What I wore was a blind man's jersey. <laughs> <laughs> now, over the years, various objects have been described as poor men's whatevers, so fingers on your buzzers now to see if you can identify any of these. You've got to be swift with this. Poor man's pork. No, I did it, and then I just suddenly realised that that is actually pork, what I thought of in my head. <laughs> so, I won't say it. Sorry, Jack, no point. Mm. In every sense. <laughs> Any advance? <laughs> Poor man's pork. Is it when you try and eat a piggy bank? <laughs> no, it isn't, Milton. It's an armadillo from the southern United States. <laughs> Poor man's pork. Gonna give you another one now. <laughs> Poor man's piano. <laughs> Keyboard. <laughs> well, that's quite ingenious. Yeah. And it's it? logical. You get a point for it. It's not the answer, but I'm giving you a point. Is it zebra crossing? <laughs> <laughs> Two points. Mm -hmm. For the scale on which you think. <laughs> the poor man's piano. It's a Canadian phrase. It's a kind of food. A plate of beans. Oh, oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good with armadillo. Mm. If you can't work out the link, it's because they both result in a lot of noise. What? Eating beans makes a lot of noise. You should try eating an armadillo. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man's men. <laughs> Women. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm used to being on Mock the Week. Yeah. <laughs> it's a joke that scores you five full points. Well done, yeah. Jack. Poor man's men is indeed women, according to oh. a former... <laughs> yeah, that is according to a former dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. It's shocking stuff, I agree, enough to make you want to buy a tent. <laughs> oh, the next round is all about toponyms, which are place names that have gained an additional meaning, like a Bakewell tart. Sorry, Joan, only joking. And um, <laughs> using the powers of wit and creativity that have made Wordaholics famous, we're calling this round Toponyms of the Pops. Yes, toponym pickers, because nothing says rock and roll quite like obscure points of lexical <laughs> taxonomy. I'm going to give our panellists a term deriving from a place name and ask them to have a brutal stab at what it might mean. Natalie... I'm going to come to you first. Natalie, what would you be doing if you were to play the Chicago piano? 
I would like to say dropping a piano from a great height and thus causing the St. Valentine's Day squishing. Um, <laughs> but I suspect that isn't right. It must be something to do with gangsters. A violin cases? Something, a, a gun. Yes, and then you... But at the same time... Yes, do that again, do that again. Because that works well on the radio, I think. And do it towards the sky. If you're doing it into the sky, what are you aiming at? What Windows. Are you at? Up, up, up. Birds. Mm. Planes. planes. <laughs> yeah. planes. Did you say planes? planes? Yes. You would be operating an anti... Aircraft gun. You would, and you'd be scoring Whee! points. Congratulations. Yeah. You would be operating an anti-aircraft gun. This comes from the gangsters of the 1920s, known for their love of shootouts. I'm actually a grade seven at the Chicago piano. Would have been grade eight, but I shot the examiner. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, I'm going to turn to you now. What do you think Newcastle disease might be? <laughs> right, I had that, but I took antibiotics, and it's cleared up now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely fine. No, Newcastle disease, is that the inability to wear a coat? Because <laughs> I, I watch um, a programme, Geordie Shaw, which is about people from Newcastle, and some of the clothes they wear on that is incredible. There's a woman on it called Holly, and she wears a skin-tight fishnet boob tube. Um, and the skin-tight... I'm not a fashion expert, but the skin-tight fishnet boob tube is quite a hard look to pull off for any woman, but she's, like, she's quite a big lass, and I have nothing against big lasses, but if you are a bigger lass, don't wear the skin-tight fishnet boob tube. <laughs> she walks around Newcastle City Centre looking like a manatee that's been hauled in by a sea trawler. It's awful. <laughs> now, put it away. Is it something to do with clothing? No, hopeless, hopeless answer. Insulting to Newcastle, insulting to people with larger figures. Um... <laughs> It's a disease, it's a condition that affects chicken and other domestic birds. It was first discovered in Newcastle in... Susie Dent, you're right, 1926. <laughs> OK, to finish off this round, I'm going to ask if our panellists have any of their own freshly devised toponyms to offer. Are there any place names that richly deserve a new meaning? Jack. Jack, you are a toponym, of course. Whitehall. Whitehall, it's a place, and there you are, Whitehall Jack. You are a walking toponym. Yeah, but, uh, that. You, you need a point. I'm going to give you yeah. one. Glasgow <laughs> <laughs> kiss is that? That's a toponym, isn't it? It is a toponym. That, is, I like that one. That's what does it mean? The headbutt. The headbutt. To headbutt someone. someone. What a slur on Glasgow. <laughs> 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 Susie, how about you? What's your toponym going to be? There was one that I've been reading in a very old dictionary called a Westminster Wedding, which describes a marriage between a whore and a rogue, but it also went on to describe a coalition where there was a quick sort of fondle and then a lot of regret. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite useful, politically speaking, don't you think? Perhaps. What was the description of the first one? A marriage? A marriage between a rogue and a whore. There's another topic of that, which is called The Only Way is Essex. <laughs> Very ingenious, Susie. I didn't actually get the word that was the toponym and all that. Westminster Wedding. A Westminster Wedding. Well done. Finally, Natalie, have you given us one? I would like to give you the feeling of being trapped in East Anglia. Suffocation. Oh. <laughs> An enthusiasm for the Middle East. Yemen zest. Oh. Uh, <laughs> quite hard oh, this is good. We're building, we're building. Keep going. Uh, a South American who might star in a film opposite John Travolta, that would be Bolivia Newton-John. I'm so sorry. Well, you're piling up the points there, Natalie. Milton. Well, firstly, I'm having a point for Milton Keynes. <laughs> you certainly are. And secondly, tourism in Dorset is well known as the surprise Japanese attack on Pool Harbour. <laughs> device to contact dead Scottish people is the Glaswegi board. <laughs> A point for each of those. Well done. If you'll allow me to wheel out an old and much-loved wordaholics catchphrase, it's the end of the round. So let's have a look at the scores. Oh, Natalie and Jack, you're doing very well indeed. You've already got 22 points. And only just ahead of you, Milton and Susie on 31. <laughs> According to George Orwell, the first rule of good writing is to never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech that you are accustomed to seeing in print. To which I usually respond, yes, but necessity is the mother of invention. There's more than one way to skin a cat. And anyway, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. 
which is by way of saying that this next round is all about clichés and finding new ways to express those sentiments that have been expressed too often. How would you find a new way to say, too many cooks spoil the broth? Can we go with too many cooks spoil the bestseller charts? Ooh. Sometimes I like a book that isn't by somebody who cooks things. Or just like television in general, there are far too many TV chefs. Yeah. So many of them just overcomplicate things. Like Hugh Funny Witting Store, whenever you turn on anything that he's doing, he's sifting through a garden to try and find like slugs or putting a partridge in a pie and just stuff that you'd never ever be able to use <laughs> if you live in a city like most people do. And then Heston Blumenthal, who just talks nonsense. Like, I saw him doing one recently where he was like, this dish tells a story. It's like, well, so does alphabetic spaghetti if you put in enough <laughs> work. And then Jamie Oliver, who just overcomplicates the most simple of... Like, I saw him recently doing a spit roast chicken where all he appeared to do is cook the chicken and then talk near it. And I don't want any of that. I reckon they should put all their recipes into one book and then Delia Smith can do it and the world would be a better place. Hey. Yeah. Too easy. How about too many books spoil the brothel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're Very discovering ripping. the sort of raunchy side <laughs> yeah. that you can't sort of let loose with at 2.30 in the afternoon on Countdown. <laughs> Quick, Milton, help me. Uh, a trip to the northwest of England is often spoiled by the people and places of the northwest of England. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, there we are. Our team struck while the iron was hot and uh, made hay while the sun shone. So, language is an addictive subject and it's possible to overindulge. These days, we're all much more aware of the importance of brevity, thanks in part to Twitter, which forces us to constrain our most verbose, circumlocutory and downright periphrastic thoughts into 140 characters or fewer. This round is called Short But Tweet, and I'll be asking our wordaholics to listen to various long-winded utterances, then condense them into a Twitter-friendly form. Natalie, can you start us off with this from the works of W.H. Auden? I love you, dear. I love you till China and Africa meet, and the river jumps over the mountain, and the salmon sing in the street. I love you until the ocean is folded and hung up to dry, and the seven stars go squawking like geese about the sky. Natalie, would you reduce that fine piece of poetry by Whiston Orton to no more than 140 characters? I love you, although I am no David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you three points for that Neat answer Salmon do not sing in the street That's just Attenborough could have told them that at the get-go <laughs> Auden's poetry brought tears to our eyes Well, for a moment In Richard Curtis's Four Weddings and a Funeral And uh, Mr Curtis was later to repeat the trick With The Boat That Rocked Which brought tears to everyone else's eyes Throughout <laughs> Milton, here's one for you to retweet A little bit of Shakespeare This from Love's Labour's Lost if drawing my sword against the humour of my affection would deliver me from the reprobate thought of it, I would take desire prisoner and ransom him to any French courtier for a new devised curtsy. I'm going to stab you, innit? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong sentiment. I was just talking to you, Giles. <laughs> Down. Love first thing I said to my children on the morning after the general election. <laughs> Before I danced that little jig. Mm. Current law, and even with the so-called normal retirement age for Social Security slated to move up to 67 over the next two decades, the ratio of the number of years that the typical worker will spend in retirement to the number of years he or she works will rise in the long term. We want it concise, please. 140 characters at most. Work, 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 Ah, light. He hasn't got room for the life. I think that is actually the essence of it. I'm going to give you all the points because you did it under the right number of words. People are living longer. You've got to go on working. I thought the other version of that would be, Giles, unfortunately, we're going to be replacing you with a younger host. And his name is Jack. Yeah. On we sweep now. And, oh, finally, it's you, Jack. I would like you to offer me a retweeted version of this excerpt from a classic of English literature. It's a book called Shark-Infested Waters. Oh. <laughs> it's by Michael Whitehall, legendary theatrical agent, and I believe your father. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's, I think, what you've always believed. How is she going to read from a pulped book? 
<laughs> Jack, wait, Tom. Oh, no, he'll be really upset. And this will probably be the only thing that he's ever listened to me on as well. <laughs> oh, he doesn't have Channel 4. Say it again, but from a book she, that's so prized oh, yeah. and precious How, that... Oh, it'll be good to hear this from a best-selling book that lots of people bought and enjoyed. No, no, this is from your father's book. <laughs> And I gave the copy... You, you, you gave a quote on the, on the cover. It I says, gave a Giles quote Brandred, on the cover. Not as good as my books. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. And I then gave the book to the lovely uh, Tracy Wiles, who is now going to read a little bit from it okay. to us. The Galaxy Club offered debauchery on a level I was unaware existed. A huge room was filled with sprawling men and women in various stages of undress. My two friends swiftly disappeared, having been offered services upstairs. I was left fully dressed in my pinstripe suit with a large, naked, heavy-breasted woman sitting on my lap. <laughs> I and that's how I met your mother. The, uh... <laughs> Listeners may find this hard to believe, but that genuinely is a paragraph from a book by Michael Whitehall, who is actually the father of Jack Whitehall. I've seen the tests. Um, <laughs> I think, actually, if you wanted a sort of brief definition, it could safely be covered with the three words, too much information. <laughs> <laughs> much like the hairline of our beloved Sir Terry Wogan, language is in a state of constant flux. New words are always being added to the dictionary as old ones slip away. This round is called New Words for Old, where we give our panel a word from an ancient dictionary and they have to work out a modern definition. And if you'll just bear with us for a moment while we wait for this week's guest dictionary to arrive from the stacks. <laughs> ah, oh, this week's guest dictionary is that 1829 classic, The Hallamshire Glossary by Joseph Hunter which contains strange old words as used in South Yorkshire way back when it was all just fields. So back in last March. <laughs> Natalie Haynes, you're first up. What does it mean to cronk? Is it a 16th century country dance? Is it B, a way of crowing over someone's misfortune? Or C, to cook a meal using nothing but scraps? Cronk does sound like a dance thing. Like, you might listen to some hip-hop and be like, yeah, I got crunk in my trunk. <laughs> I think it would be a dance move. You think wrong. <laughs> what were the other ones? A way of crowing over someone's misfortune or cooking a meal using nothing but scraps. It was definitely one of them. So yeah. should, we just, <laughs> should we just pick just, one? Just to, just crow, pick one. To, crow to crow over crow. someone's misfortune. You get a couple of points for getting hey. that right, yes. Oh. To cronk is to crow over, to rejoice in insulting someone. Two points for you there. Jack. What do you think might be the correct definition of a knock nobbler? Knock nobbler. Nobbler, I think, suggests like maybe being like over amorous and sort of raunchy, like nobbler, like nobbling. I thought knock nobbler might be like a weapon, like the olden days women used to keep in their olden days handbags instead of mace. So if someone came up and tried to give them a little <laughs> nobble in an alleyway, boom, knocked right in the nobble. I think I, I think I must try and help you with your one track mind and take you elsewhere. <laughs> Do you think it might be A, a bouncer in a church, a knock nobbler, a short underarm delivery in 18th century cricket, a knock nobbler, or C, a very early shoehorn? I think it is a bouncer in a church who has to go and knock nobble people who are pinching the parson. <laughs> oh, yes. For a complete, correct, I and full answer, some you score information four from points. The show. Congratulations. <laughs> A knock nobbler is indeed the man who walks around the church during a service keeping order. The word knob here refers to people's heads, and according to Mr. Joseph Hunter, our dictionary maker, the rest explains itself. You might, of course, have tried to bribe the knock nobbler by offering him a biscuit, in which case you'd be nobbling the knock nobbler with a hobnob. <laughs> Milton Jones, here's one for you. What do you think is a hand cell? H-A-N-D-S-E-L is the word. Yep. Let me give you some options here. Do you think it might be A, the sill of a sash window, B, the first purchase in a newly opened shop, or C, a thick coat of varnish often applied to the rollocks of a rowing boat? Um, is it a shop thing? 
Yes, it is indeed the first purchase in a newly opened shop, which is marvellous, isn't it? Don't you think? Mm. Mm. I recently planned to make the hand sell when an Apple store opened in our neighbourhood. I queued up all night, then was first in to place my order. Two pink ladies and a Cox's orange pippin. <laughs> Okay, well, that smirgasbrot of etymological buffoonery marks the end of this week's show, and I see from the scoreboard that this week's winners are... Oh, Natalie and Jack, you're just ahead with 37 points. So congratulations to our winners, then, for our losers. What can I say? Words fail me. All I can manage is a noise, and that noise is... Bad luck. Before we go, could you each describe your wordaholics experience in one word? Milton? Limbo. <laughs> uh, which brings back happy memories because I actually, at sports day at school, on the limbo dancing, or as they called it, came last in the high jump. <laughs> Susie Dent. Well, just to go back to that one word that made me happy, I'd say it was blurbable. Mmm, <laughs> blurbable. A, coin, a coinage of the day. Oh, lovely. Let's Let's check it in the dictionary. No, it is not there. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. I'm going to put it in this evening. <laughs> blurbable. <laughs> Natalie Haynes, one word that describes this experience. Buffling. <laughs> I'm, I'm scooting around dyscalculic because I think you must have added up the scores wrong. So, yeah, baffling. <laughs> baffling. Oh, no, quite correctly. You, right. did, you did very well. You came up with some proper answers for a change. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Whitehall, in a word. Towards the end, tiring, because I haven't been able to close my eyes for fear of visualising my father in a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this week's Wordaholics. Will you please thank once more our wonderful guests, Jack Whitehall, Susie Dent, Natalie Haynes and Milton Jones. <laughs> Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to Wordaholics, chaired by Giles Brandreth. The reader is Tracy Wiles. It's written by John Hunter and James Kettle and the producer is...